Hello, and welcome back to another great edition of Ghost Stories Told from the South. I am your host, Stephen LeBooth, and boy, do I have some skilly, skilly stuff for you today. <laughs> well, as you can see, I'm feeling better. Thank you guys for bearing with me last week, man. I came down with... I had a bad sinus infection. It was just my sinuses fucking with me. and ooh, So sorry if my voice isn't back all the way yet. I'm working on it. <coughs> <coughs> Still got this cough a little bit. Hacking up that phlegm. Yeah, it's gross. I know. Ah, but if you guys want to check it out, uh, I got a YouTube version going with it. So I'm doing a video right now with its podcast. So... I need to get that caught up. I think I'm three episodes behind. <laughs> so it happens when you get sick. Everything piles up. <coughs> <coughs> so I'm going to try to get through this the best I can, guys. just want to say thank you to everybody who listens. And the numbers keep growing and growing. On Spotify, we're getting bigger. Thank you for the Spotify listeners. Thank you to the YouTube listeners. Wherever you get this podcast and you're listening to it, thank you very, very, very much. And don't be uh, afraid to go check my page out on Facebook and uh, send me a DM. Tell me a story about something that's haunted in your town or whatever. So I think that'd be all right. But thank you, guys. Like I said, the numbers are getting bigger and bigger, and I love it. I love it. I love it. So you guys are doing great, man. Appreciate the fan base I have. Well, I guess I'll quit yapping and uh, use up my energy I got to get this uh, podcast going. I'm feeling a lot better, guys. A lot better today. Woo. All right, our first story is the Daily Mansion in Montana. We're still covering Montana, Washington, and Canada. Okay, the Daily Mansion in Hamilton, Montana, was a farmhouse when Cooper King Marcus Daly purchased the home and its surrounding property from Anthony... <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. From Anthony Chafin in 1886, the Daly's remodeled the home several times in different styles before sitting on the George Reville, Revival style scene today. The mansion was uh, damaged by years of neglect and other uh, Market Daly's death in 1941. The state of Montana bought the property in 1986 and then began painstaking work of repairing and restoring the once impressive home. Ever since the state purchased the mansion, people have described strange phenomena within the walls. Smoking is not allowed in the house, but visitors and volunteers swear they smell something. Okay. Um, where was I? Have reported distance. Okay, yeah, cigar smoke. <coughs> <coughs> okay. But uh, has no evidence. Oh, here we go. I lost my place. A painting in the music room just cannot seem to stay on the wall for long at all, but it has no evidence of falling. Some even claim to have seen Mrs. Daly herself at the house. The late former owner of this uh, sprawling estate was the uh, Cooper King uh, Marcus Daly. You can easily book a tour guide to this uh, place and uh, go check it out. And you can experience the uh, paranormal activity that occurs. Some of some of the uh, ghosts and noises and stuff they hear include a strong scent of a cigar smoke. We already know that. And Mrs. Daly's ghost walking down the hallways and paintings on the walls that move on their own. So there wasn't a whole lot on this story. 
So this one's one of my shorties for today. A shorty. I will. I, I like to ease my way in and give you guys a quickie, and then I'll give you a good long story. All righty. Okay, our next story is the Hotel de Horo in Washington. On the San Juan Island, the Hotel de Horo at Ranch Harbor Resort has its own spectacular uh, paranormal or phenomenons that happen. The ghost of Adolf Bainey governs and secretary to the uh, McMillan family who owned the local lime works around which uh, Rock Harbor was founded. The Hotel de Herrero, built uh, in 1886, is the oldest continuously running lodge in the state of Washington. Employees have reported a a storeroom door opening on its own, appliances turning on and off, and items in the store being uh, removed from the shelf or moving on the shelf from time to time. And then they sound of rustling, uh, rustling clothing when no one was there. One woman's hands went numb when she went to the, oh, to the, uh, to enter the, uh, one woman's hands went numb when she went to enter the, the lobby because the hotel is so haunted she could not go in. Here's some more stuff. Okay, guests have reported a ghost of a woman that walks the halls. Other parts of other, the other part is the family mausoleum in the uh, nearby woods too. They say is haunted. The mausoleum contains a dining room set up, and each place has a col- uh, column that holds the ashes of the family member. Some people have said it uh, said at sundown. You can see the ghost of all the family sitting at the table waiting on their dinner. That would be pretty cool to see, but kind of fucking scary, if you know what I mean. All right, that's our second one. Man, these two quickies. I'm going to turn my light up a little bit so I can see here. It's kind of hard to read. Oh, come on. There we go. I turn it up just a little brighter. This one's going to be good. This is the Duke Ranch Lodge, and it is in Evermont, Washington. Uh, Okay, I'm going to step back and read this. All right. Everybody ready? Everybody situated? Okay. The 1950s modern movement style two-story Dude Ranch Lodge and restaurant are built of bricks and wood with uh, 90 pine and piney with, oh, with naughty pine interiors. Sorry. I didn't think I was still recording. I thought it clicked off. But I aged it. Okay, with uh, naughty pine interiors. Found throughout the inside of the uh, hotel. Which that means, kind of like when you see a tree and it's just the limbs are cut off. And it's still kind of coming out some, stemming out from the tree. That's what they're talking about. Kind of to give it the, an rustic look, I guess. Um, Where was that? Found throughout the inside of the hotel, giving it a very western feel. Western feeling. Late in the weeping, uh, myrtle style on, style, on the lower part, but around a rectangular central courtyard, with a low pitched roof. The Dude Ranch Lodge has an inter inter interestable. Western appeal to it. Sorry, I'm turning my light up a little bit more. That one should do it. Okay. I found some happy... Oh, never mind. I ain't reading that. 
The Dude Ranch Lodge offers 56 comfortable guest bedrooms that are decorated with authentic Western furnishings featuring uh, branded carpet and knotty pine paneling. Guests will enjoy rooms with a king, queen, or two full-size beds and a fine list of standard uh, amenities. Plus, children stay free. So that's something to think about. You can go there, hunt for ghosts, and your kids stay free. Okay, the Dude Ranch was, this is the history of the Dude Ranch. The Dude Ranch was the first big modern hotel with a rustic old western theme built in Billings, Montana. The Dude Ranch was the uh, dream hotel of Annabella and Per, per uh, Percy Gone. Built with the financial help from an area rancher and businessman. Bricks from the old buildings that were demolished were used again to build its uh, much-wanted hotel. San Vin the St. Vincent Hospital, the Russell Refinery, and the Washington School all contributed some bricks from the uh, construction of its uh, interesting hotel. Percy and Annabella worked along with architects firm of Cushing and Terrell to create a beautiful fictional two-story building with a basement. The wings of the hotel create a square courtyard where park is a parking is available. In 1962 Annabella and uh, Percy were in a car wreck where Percy uh, while Percy passed over to the other side, Annabelle survived and continued running the Dude, uh, Dude Rancher Lodge. With the help of her, uh, with the help of her staff, who appreciated Annabelle's warm uh, appreciation for them, threatening them like uh, treating them like her family. In the in Annabelle's last years of life. She was cared for by her devoted staff. In 1983, she was uh, moved into a nursing home where she, too, passed over shortly afterward. Annabelle's grandson ran the Dude Rancher Lodge for a while. Since 1991, Virginia Carl Carl ugh, Carlson has owned the Dude Rancher Lodge and does not believe in spirits, though some entities are apparently keeping her and her staff and her guest company. <coughs> <coughs> and have you always noticed that people say that don't believe in that crap gets fucked with the most? All right, here's the history of the, uh, the ghost and stuff there. When people invest, invest their blood... Sweat and tears into a beloved business. They th sometimes like to continue it on their other life. Enjoying their building and trying to support the uh, continuing efforts to commerce taking place in the st uh, structure. They often try to keep an eye on things. The former owners of the Dude Rancher Lodge may still be there. The former owner, oh, sometimes spirits are residential energy and can attach to the materials of the structure and move when the uh, structure is moved or attached to the uh, materials when they are used to build something else. So basically what they're saying is, because uh, four buildings, I think, contributed bricks to this place, so if that building had a history of being ghosts and it's, you know, they used them bricks. I, I mean, that... I know people think that's uh, bullshit. Nah, whatever. You know, well, it, it it's real, man. I mean, it's, I can't explain it, but I mean, shit. Anyways, either children entities or the uh, energy came along with the bricks from the Washington School that were used to uh, build part of the hotel. Sometimes employees of the business connect so strongly to their job that they do not let death get in the way of continu continuing in their own way in spirit form. Sometimes employees, oh, a former cook thought to be Bob, 
who lived in room two two a little two hundred and twenty two 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 uh likes to come into the kitchen and make himself a snack. An entity presents seems to uh work in the basement area. Oh, an entity present seems to work in the basement area. So when he goes down to make him a snack late at night, he'll see a figure there. Hmm. This is active all over the hotel. But the most haunted rooms are 223 and 224 and 226. They are often reserved, reserved one year in advance. The male entity of the longtime cook, Bob, is thought to be the spirit that clander, that clank, clander, the uh, <coughs> clangs the pots and pans in the hotel kitchen at night. When alive, Bob used to come and make himself a, uh, make himself a snack before going to bed. There is no uh, residual explanation for the uh, paranormal activity that has been felt and heard by staff. The investigation and guests around midnight, oh, the investigators and guests around midnight, oh, that the herd, oh, felt and heard by the staff and the investigators and guests around midnight. So they always hear something around midnight. Bob was friends with current uh, handyman. In one instance, the handyman was looking for a fuse. When he came back, one was sitting on his bench that wasn't there before. That's pretty cool. I mean, that'd flip me the fuck out, but that's pretty cool. He's helping. The unmistakable sound of children running up and down the second floor hallway have been heard by guests and staff when no living children or guests of, are at the lodge at that time. So even when there's no kids, they'll still hear them kids running up and down the hallway. A guest heard the commotion, opened her door, of course not seeing anything alive, but she heard a disbottled voice coming from the hallway of an older woman saying, the entity of entity of Annabelle. Her favorite room that she likes to visit is room 226, where her grandson stayed when he was in charge of the lodge. Uh, paranormal activity begins soon after her passing. Housekeepers uh, know her well. When the door to 226 won't open with a key, they ask Annabelle, to please open the door, and the door suddenly can't open. Well, at least she's a nice ghost. You know? Okay, the entity of Annabelle. Okay, the entity of Annabelle has been seen wearing a nightgown and walking, walking the second floor, perhaps looking for her guest. She apparently enjoys looking out the windows. She may be the one who said shh to the uh, running entity children. Maids working on the second floor rooms have heard someone cl uh, climbing the stairs and walking down the hallway, but no one is no one is ever seen. The unknown male or female entity in the basement. A staff member was doing laundry in the basement when he saw a shadow quickly move uh, towards the fold, move towards the folding, folding and storage area. Oh, but where the area where they fold the clothes and stuff. A female voice responded to a question that was caught on tape in the basement too. Is it still haunted? Most probably so. Personal experiences in experiences and some hard hard evidence captured suggest that some being or entities are still on the uh, ranch who love their former business many people have personal experiences with spirits who stay here still to this day 
Oh, listen to this now. Around Halloween every year, they have a big old, they uh, lead big old tours through the haunted buildings and starting with the Dude Ranch Lodge. While waiting for the bus to arrive with uh, people, they uh, keep you busy with stories and stuff. So that's kind of cool that you go check out if you're ever around that place. See what's going on in the kitchen. I love old buildings. I love that stuff. This is just awesome. I love going over the history of stuff and just the ghost story stuff. And I love podcasting because it's awesome. And I think I'm pretty decent at it. All right, kiddos. We are going to take a little break. Go to a commercial. And we'll be right back. Well, how's everybody doing today? This is good old friend Uncle Dickie from Borderline Texas Trash. The most popular podcast in the world today. It's climbing up the charts faster than freaking slime on a stein, baby. Well, if you're wondering, what the hell is Borderline Texas Trash about? And who is this some bitch Uncle Boo? Well, Uncle Boo is the most recognizable voice in podcasting today, baby. We're going to get funky like a monkey on some ton of greens. I'm coming in on white lightning, baby, on a silver saddle to bring you the best of borderline Texas trash, baby. I'm your host of the show, Uncle Boo. We go over everything. We do a little bit of politics at the end, but not much. I don't step into that bullshit a whole lot. But we have fun. I go over stupid world news of the day, talk about... Uh, stuff from the past, what the cost of living or stuff was like that. And we just talk about all sorts of fucking fun facts, do a little joking around. And my niece joins the show sometimes. We do a little segment called Ash Handy's Garage on Friday nights, baby. That's our live show we do sometimes. And then I got the uncle that I talked to down in uh, Boothville, Louisiana. And he calls sometimes. We have a little show called Uncle Dickie's Kona. So you guys come check out Texas Borderline, Borderline Texas Trash, baby. I know you will love it. We are on every platform you can think of. Spotify, Stitcher, Pandora, iHeart. Uh, I mean, we're on everything. We're even on Podbean, man. We even got our own YouTube channel. We even got an Instagram account, and we got our Facebook account. So go check us out, man, and come listen to the show. You'll get to listen to Ash Handy, Uncle Boo, Uncle Dicky, and all the most recognizable voices in this motherfucking podcast in the world today, baby. Because we will get funky like a monkey, I guarantee it. Let's just say, baby, I've wine and dined with kings and queens, slept in dumpsters, ate pork and beans, baby. But I am your host of the show, Uncle Boo, Borderline Texas Trash. Don't forget about it. If you want to listen to a show to just get your mind off this crazy world and all the COVID and politics bullshit, <laughs> Come check my show out. Come check me and my crazy family out. Some of the shit we do, we do live uh, shows from the barbecue. So, I'll see you later. Bye. Well, welcome back. All right. Next place we are doing is the... All right. The next story is the Rocker Mansion. In Washington. This week I've only got one um, story. Because I thought I was looking up. I mean only one for Canada. I thought I was looking up two. But I was looking up one. (laughs) Anyways. The Canada one would be the very last one. So. Here we go with the Rocker Mansion. Just 30 miles north of Seattle. Lies the sleepy town of Everett. The city is home to the uh, extravagant and very haunted house known as the Rocker Mansion. The ghost of Jane Rocker is said to reside in the mansion, still uh, lurking around after a hundred year, lurking around a hundred years after her death. She allegedly committed suicide in, in 1907 by jumping from her bedroom window. I'm sorry if I'm doing that a little too much. It just I get a lot of that phlegm, whatever crap loosening up and <coughs> trying to talk and I feel like I'm 
like a, someone I'm snorkeling and someone keeps putting her hand on the top. Ah. Anyway, sorry for yelling, guys. Didn't mean to do that. Okay, night time seven by jumping out, jumping from her bedroom window. Residents and guests claim that her ghost is known to randomly appear in the dead of the night, dead of night, and play the piano. She's also been spotted hovering by the window in her old bedroom. The Rocker family was very inter in was very blah, 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 blah. was very in the uh, community in budget, uh, budget Sound, helping to lay the lay the groundwork for the city of Everett. After moving to the after moving to the area from Ohio in the late 1800s. The family established themselves as a real estate and lumber uh, companies. Their mansion is still the most prized possession in this city, having sold for $3.5 million in 2020. Dang. Long before the Rockers helped establish modern-day Everett, the Stonemish peoples inhabited the Port Gardner Pen Peninsula for thousands of years. They had a uh, affordable winter village in the area called Hillbub. The Europeans had begun to enrich on Snohash, Snohomish, on the Snohomish territory in 1792 when George Vancouver's e expedition landed in the area and claimed the uh, Port Garter Peninsula for England. More expansions arrived in the uh, mid 1800s. Through the village of Hillbub remained mostly un undisturbed. There that was until the that was until the Treaty of Port Elliot was signed in 1855. This forced the uh, Snohomish to relocate their land to the Washington Territory and relocate the uh, Topolan Indian Reservation. Say that three times fast. The first permanent European to settle was Dennis Brigham, who arrived with Massachusetts, or from Massachusetts. He built a log cabin on a 160-acre plot of land for himself, and a handful of settlers developed small plots in the region. But it wasn't until the arrival of the Rockefeller, 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 or the Rocker, I'm sorry, Rocker family that the Port Gardner Peninsula saw real growth. In the 1800s, the Rocker family migrated westward from the Ohio, aiming from Ohio, aiming to be real American pioneers. They went all the way to the Pacific Northwest in search of investments and opportunities. They land in Tacoma, where they hoped to find cheap and a find cheap land upon with which to start a uh, lucrative tim uh, timber enterprise. The rockers, the rockers were made up of merchants, Jan Morris Rocker and her two sons, White and Beth, or Bethel. Bethel, I guess is his name. The two brothers did the hard work for scouting for the land around uh, Pudget Sound. White led, White had his eye on the uh, forested peninsula, thirty miles north of Seattle. A few Europeans had already settled the area, having forced the uh, native Snumash to relocate. White chose the area because it was a sparsely sparl populated and was the uh, expected site of the western terminus of the Great Northern Railroad. World on the street, word on the street that the region was, statted, was sta slatted to become the next Pittsburgh, or, or the next Pittsburgh, albeit with his own seaport, hoping to poise themselves before the boom. The Rockers bought thousands of acres in the peninsula, they planned on starting a township and had become uh, picking out the land into plots. The town would be called Port Gardner, 
but more uh, abjurable plans came to mind when they saw, when they got involved with the local Tomoka lumber Henry, uh, lumber man Henry Henry Hewitt. Hewitt and the Rockers started up the uh, Everett Land Company, which dealt with the timber and real estate. They were able to contract big name investors like John D. Rockefeller. Charles uh, Colby, among the among others, the uh, Rockers retained fifty percent of their original land claims, where the rest went to the company. The plan was to promote the growth of the industry city on the state on the site, and the uh, Rocker took the Rockers took serious profits when the town took off in the eighteen nineties. The city of Everett was incorrupt incorrupted in eighteen eighty three and became the seat of the Sonomish County uh, of Sonomish County in 1897. The Rockers had enough land and wealth to weather the storm during the econo uh, economic the economy bust of the late 1890s. The boom cycle came back around during the 1900s, and the Rockfords found themselves well posed once again to turn profit. They were just smart with their money. The Everland Company turned over its holdings to another company controlled by James Hill, the head of the Great Northern Rail, uh, Railway, of which White Rocker became the uh, treasurer. As the city grew, the Rockers profited from the timber industry and the railroad. They had also became selling their own plots of land, which became the Rocker Hill neighborhood, having helped establish both themselves and the budding town of Everett. The family decided to begin building a plot for themselves. In the incoming years, the area would see huge economic growth, becoming an in, in, blah, blah, industrial, industrial powerhouse. Timber milling and shipping were the main, main industries. The, uh, the uh, industry workers of the uh, lumber unrest were, was common especially during the economic slump. Workers often clashed with businesses, strike breakers, and police. It all came to a head in 1916 at the uh, Effort Massacre when seven workers were shot dead by anti-union uh, uh, forces, or unionist forces. Now, we're getting to the Rocker Mansion, finally. The Rocker Mansion. It was construct, uh, -da. construction on the Rocker Mansion beginning in 1904 at a cost of $400,000. That was back then. Damn, I bet you that was like a castle of them back then. The, this is equal to a whopping $11 million today. Jesus Christ. <coughs> <coughs> the house was a wedding gift for a Beth... Bethel Rocker's newly wedded wife, Ruby Brown. The Rockers chose the best part of the land under the ownership upon which built the massive home. Even through the even through the home was meant for even though the home was meant for Ruby, the family all lived lived there together. They moved in during the summer of 1905. I remember that summer. That was so much fun. They moved in during the summer of 1905, just 15, 15 years after the Rockers arrived in the forest, in the forest lands of the peninsula. Through their arrival, was married with, with tragedy. Just two years after moving in, Jan Rocker committed suicide in the home by jumping from the, uh, jumping from her bedroom window. The Rocker Mansion was deemed a National Historical Landmark in 1975, and it is on the most look, it's one of the most luxurious homes in Everett still to this day. It's got 6,000 square feet of living space and 2.7 acres. Uh, at four stories, the mansion is decked out with six bedrooms, six bathrooms, a library, a ballroom, a billiards room, two kitchens, a dining room, a 
conservatory, and much more. The house was put on the market for three point five million in two thousand twenty. Whoever who whoever whoever the lucky buyers are, I hope they are aware of the ghost that lurks inside. I would love to buy that place. That'd be cool. I could do so much podcast in there while the ghosts are messing with me. The ghost of the Rocker family. Jane Morris Rocker promptly uh, killed herself in 1907 by jumping from the bedroom window. Just two years after moving into the Rocker mansion with her two sons and daughter-in-law. For over a century, the death has been a mystery as nobody knows why exactly caused Jane to commit suicide. Some local historians debate whether Jane even committed suicide in the first place. Ah, oh, the township senses a little foul play. Something's a little fishy. Whatever her actual cause of death, there's no doubt that her ghost still lives in a rocker mansion. Most residents who lived in the mansion after the rocker family have reported strange paranormal experiences. Most notably, the grand piano would automatically play the uh, dead of would automatically the grand piano would automatically play in the middle of the night. Jane was known to be a great pianist. The many spectacular that her ghost takes the keys when nobody is looking. Interestingly enough, many also heard the piano playing when approaching the house during Halloween. Jane Rocker also reveals her presence in other ways. Many have seen her apparition floating around the house in her bedroom gown, uh, usually in her old bedroom. She can be seen looking out the same window that allegedly she jumped from, seemingly lost in thought. Other phenomena include these strange shadows, usually sharp drops of, temp- drops of temperature, and guests being touched by, uh, by phantom hands. There are even rumors that the ghost of Ruby Brown lives in the Rocker Mansion as well. Well, that was a pretty good one. Even though it kind of... that well, I mean, it was good. I mean, even though it kind of... it went. I like it when they really go into detail and say how that house is there, why it's there, instead of... Oh, this is the Stephen Booth house. It was uh, built in 1901, and it's been haunted because of this. I mean, I kind of like them once they go into detail like that. I think that's pretty awesome sauce. Ah. All right, guys. It's our last one, and this one's in Canada. And it's called the MTS Center. And I believe this is... In, I want to say Manitoba. I'm not for sure. But here we go. See, that's another one that's going to be short. Because I can only really find like one part. I mean, there wasn't a a whole lot. You know, some stories I get, I can be here all day. Some stories, I'll be here five minutes. So, that's kind of funny though. I hit you with a quick one, then I last you long for the big one. Then I hit you with a quick one to tell you goodbye. The ha- the haunting at the MT at the MTC, the what's the abbreviation for that? The Manitoba Theater, the Manitoba Theater Center, became with its uh, original location in the long since demolished uh, Domino Theater. A young boy named George, son of the original theater's caretakers and confidants to a... Oh, and he was confined to a wheelchair. He became trapped. When the theater moved, it took him a couple of years to follow, but George, the friendly ghost, still still roams the MTC today. He often uh, causes harmless pranks, but occasionally lets the staff know when he is... uh, unsatisfied with an actor or a sh- or a show not quite casper nice but nice enough i would say and 
that's it for that. So, hey, if anybody in Canada has more on that MTC Center, send it to me on my Facebook. DM me. Slide in my DMs. Let me know, man. <coughs> Next week should be better for Canada. It's just uh, I thought I had two stories for Canada this week, and I just had one. But I think I'm getting close. Maybe I think next week will be our last episode for uh, our last. Uh, next week, I'll do the last bit of Washington, Montana, and uh, Canada. And then I'll probably go on and uh, start looking up some good Halloween stories or something. You know, because it's just ghost stories, you know. So maybe I could look up some scary, scary stories. I'm still trying to set up some stuff so we can sit around the fire, me and my niece and kids and stuff, and tell some spooky stories and make a podcast about that. I think that would be awesome. But, man, you guys are good. Thanks for putting up with me. Hope I didn't scare you too bad tonight. <laughs> but this has been Stephen LeBooth with Ghost Stories Told from the South. I hope you have a great evening. And you guys, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for all the downloads and all the listening you do and all the followers. Just keep it up. We're growing. And I'm going to try to get into making some shirts or something. You know, get some merch going. Maybe you guys like to buy a shirt or something. I don't know. I'm going to get something going. You know, because I just want to please the fans, give you all some good material. But if you're listening and it's anywhere around the world, email me or DM me, Ghost Stories Told from the South. Look me up on Facebook and uh, let me know what uh, y'all's kind of Halloween spooky stories are. Because every place has some good old Halloween stories. So around the world, you're listening to this, tell me. We'll talk about them and tell them on the show, man. I love learning other, other people's cultures. And I love learning their uh, other countries' uh, histories and stuff. So it's awesome. So, But you guys, be good. Don't get too scared now to, tonight. But we will see you later. Bye-bye.